us Mr. W. E. Burge, a gentleman of consummate strength, ability, and integrity. I recently picked up a book by the name of Legends, written by Gene Asher, a former writer for the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. It is a book about Georgians who lived in possible dreams. It was no surprise to me to open the book and find Lee Burge's picture and story on the front page, entitled W. Lee Burge, A Horatio Alger Story. After chronologically outlining his many contributions to our state, including being the CEO of Equifax and the Fernbank Museum, his many board memberships, his civic and church accomplishments, it concludes by saying, in an age when most people have long retired, Lee Burge, an old World War II infantryman, is nowhere near ready to take off his pack. Lee, thank you for being here today, and please tell us about the pack you carried before, during, and after the war. It is both an honor and a privilege to have you here with us. Thank you, David. I'm, I'm privileged to be here with you. Having uh, grown up with your family and uh, ha having watched you grow up, and so I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you personally. Uh, I, I haven't taken off my pack <laughs> as, as such. Uh, as an infantryman, I guess I'm still an infantryman at heart, in spite of the fact that uh, my uh, military career was uh, relatively brief and, and was uh, not historic by any manner of means. But I, uh, uh, I did enjoy my military duty, and I'm glad to have been a part of it. Uh, I was born in the Depression, of course, and uh, grew up in the Depression and started school relatively early, working my way in odd jobs and that sort of thing, uh, wor uh, working my way along, and I enjoyed uh, the experiences of developing and growing and seeing uh, America grow as it did during the Depression years. I uh, started in my military connections uh, with uh, learning about the war and seeing the war developed in, uh, in Europe. And, and I uh, studied the aspects of it and, and all of my uh, uh, younger uh, relatives were being drafted uh, into military duty or, and getting their degrees and, uh, and their commissions and that sort of thing. And I was comparatively younger. I was drafted uh, at a relatively late age. I, I wasn't drafted until I was uh, 20. Uh, four years old, 25 years old, which was unusual to some degree because a lot of people were being drafted at 18 and 19 years old. I went, I went to school uh, and uh, was in the investigation field. It was credit investigations and employment investigations and that sort of thing. And one of the jobs that uh, we had in the early days of the war was investigating people who were going into military duty, uh, going into officer candidates, going into the hospitals and uh, nursing jobs and things of that nature. And uh, we investigated their character uh, and reputation, their reliability, uh, as we would a person applying for a, a, an employment job. And that was basically uh, our, our function in the earlier years of the war. Uh, we were in the investigation field uh, when they were organizing the Bell Bomber plant uh, in Atlanta, for example. Was this part of Equifax? Well, it was part of Equifax, but it was named Retail Credit Company in those days. Okay. But they were, they were in Retail Credit Company investigations okay. 
in those days, and and we retained that corporate name until the 1970s, and uh, to adopt a, a more modern name, we changed it from Retail Credit Company to Equifax. But uh, I did that sort of work uh, in the armament plants and uh, in places throughout the country, uh, candidates for uh, for jobs uh, in armament plants and uh, what we called uh, necessary jobs, and I functioned in that role. And of course, uh, in those years, we had uh, great emergencies from the standpoint of employment vacancies. We just didn't have the manpower. Matter of fact, most all of our college graduates were going uh, on military duty. Uh, so we had uh, many, many people uh, that weren't available for that. And fortunately, I was uh, enabled to continue my investigation work as a sort of a necessary uh, employment man. And I had a, a, a wife and a child at that particular time. and. Uh, I, uh, uh, I I lived with them for a time, uh, and and uh, and and actually traveled all over the United States working because of the manpower shortage uh, in in investigation work. Uh, I stayed in the uh, in the retail credit company or now Equifax. Uh, all of my business career. I started out with them uh, in the mail section of that company and uh, uh, gravitated to field jobs, in not only investigation jobs, but organization and development jobs, both from, in, from the standpoint of the wartime development uh, and investigation work uh, as it uh, pertained to uh, uh, World, War, uh, World War II service, but I also uh, stayed uh, in, in the military uh, and, and worked with them to develop their manpower programs uh, as they developed their employment programs in wartime development. Um, I worked around to in, in various parts of the country, in the United States and Canada, uh, in those periods of time uh, uh, to, to, to help develop their employment and training programs. I, I, I went away from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the retail credit company uh, in, into the Army. I was drafted at age 25, they finally cut off uh, the age at the, at the time of the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, we had a, uh, a program where everybody who was under 25 years of age was drafted. And I was drafted at that particular time. That was the first time that I had been subject to the draft because of my emergency status before in, in, the, in the investigation field. Uh, but I was drafted, and uh, and I started in the field artillery. Uh, was there for my basic training, and then I stayed in the uh, uh, the basic training uh, for the six month period that we was normally uh, in basic training, uh, and uh, very quickly thereafter, uh, I was given a transfer to the. Uh, to the uh, uh, the uh, infantry at the infantry school at Fort Benning as a candidate, the officer candidate. Uh, at that particular time, they weren't giving uh, very many direct uh, promotions into officer ranks. You had to go through a basic training period first. And I went through a, a basic training period and had my basic, and then I got 
uh, my promotion as a second lieutenant in the uh, in the in the artillery, uh, not in the I mean in the uh, uh, in the infantry, and began to train uh, uh, men uh, t to put them into infantry work, and I did that for about six months. This. Uh, was also very closely related to the Battle of Bulls at that time. Mm -hmm. We were having extremely heavy losses uh, in, the, in the Battle of the Bulls, and uh, they were having as heavy losses in uh, officer candidates as they did in, uh, in, uh, in riflemen. And so uh, uh, they were putting us through some training uh, to prepare us for field training of people and actually we began to train uh, young men uh, to invade Japan. Uh, that, was, that, that was our basic thrust uh, at that particular time. Uh, for a period of uh, uh, Six, six or eight months, I'm not sure what, I was an officer candidate and got my second lieutenant's bars uh, at that time and um, uh, and I began to, uh, 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 to, uh, to prepare to invade Japan uh, and w with, with troops that were being assigned for that particular purpose. Very quickly thereafter, the atomic bomb was exploded, and that changed the whole military strategy. And it was at that particular time uh, they uh, had a, a very strategic change in all of the military units. Uh, I was asked. Uh, to go into an administrative job, and I went into the operations officer's job uh, at Fort Meade, Maryland, uh, to uh, transfer troops from uh, Germany uh, to uh, Japan, and they were uh, taking. They were. Uh, putting on leave all of the men uh, who had sufficient experience and, and time and that sort of thing. Uh, and we would transfer them uh, on leave for about 30 days or 90 days, and I'm not sure now what the time limits were. Uh, but uh, I transferred officers for, uh, for about six or eight months uh, from uh, uh, from Europe uh, home for a few months or a few weeks uh, and then uh, and then went uh, to the uh, uh, to the Pacific theater uh, I functioned in that uh, operations officer job for quite some time and got quite well versed with the administrative duties. I was a, the adjutant general's uh, operations officer uh, and I got pretty familiar with that that particular function. Uh, and uh, But I, I functioned in that job uh, for uh, about almost eight or ten months and uh, and then they were uh, granting leave uh, to those who were eligible for leave at that particular time, and that's when I uh, I was discharged. I went on reserve duty uh, for five years, I think. I'm not sure uh, the exact period, uh, and stayed on reserve duty and I must say uncomfortable. <laughs> reserve duty because we were all always still worried about uh, Korean War. And um, as a matter of fact, I, 
I wouldn't buy any dress shoes for about uh, a year because, <laughs> because I wanted to be able to wear, wear them <laughs> when I went, went back on active duty. <laughs> and uh, 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 so I, I was a little bit uncomfortable during that period of time thinking I would be called back to active duty. I also had a little bit of uh, uh, agitated uh, experience along about that time because I had three uh, former uh, colonels and generals who had been at the infantry school and I was when I was down there and I knew them all matter of fact I went to school both here in Atlanta and also other places with some of them uh, and in uh, under under some of them uh, and they were always asked after me to come back to the infantry school <clears throat> And I, 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 had, I stayed on needles and pins <clears throat> uh, for two or three years, really, uh, thinking that I would have to be called back to duty. And uh, uh, but I, I did not have to go back, and uh, thankfully so. And and fortunately, my company was very good to me in that particular time, and I, I was able to uh, earn. A, satisfactory living all that <laughs> a period of time. I think I met you for the first time about that time, <laughs> early 1950s when <laughs> Korea was going on. That's right. But in any event, that was, that was, that was really basically my military career, David. You uh, alluded to growing up during the Depression in Atlanta and being aware and cognizant of the war in Europe going on the what was the mood of the country during the Depression, and did you feel isolationist during the 1930s, or were you too young to look at it in that regard? It sounds like you had a more in-depth vision of what was going on than the average person did at that point in time. I'm just wondering what your I, I, recollections are. I, I never had an isolationist attitude. I always thought that this was something that we had to be involved in, that we had to be committed to, uh, that it was the, the salvation uh, of the, uh, uh, the American dream and the American way of life uh, and the, the things that we had dedicated ourselves to from our forefathers uh, through the Civil Wars, uh, as mixed up as, as they were, uh, uh, and, and into the periods uh, that came along even in World War uh, One. Uh, I had a, uh, 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 one or two relatives who were in World War One in the 1918 and 1919 period when I was really just a kid, mm -hmm. uh, but before I was eligible myself. Uh, but I was very much aware of that. And uh, uh, and was dedicated to it, and and uh, even in high school, uh, we had a very strong feeling about uh, the uh, uh, the commitments that we had uh, to uh, the British people in particular, uh, and to some degree, uh, even the German people. Uh, I. I had a little bit of a German background uh, on one of my grandparents' side, and I uh, I had a feeling of uh, affinity, affinity to them and uh, and loyalty to them. Where did you go to high school? I went to Tech High School. Tech High School. Yeah. And what was Tech High like during the Depression years? Well, of course, economically. Uh, it was a very uh, difficult period. There were relatively few uh, scholarships, even for uh, athletes, uh, I mean, in comparison to this day and time. Uh, there were very few scholarships, uh, and, uh, 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 and you had to work your way uh, through school 
in various and sundry ways. As a matter of fact, the, the GI Bill of Rights was a great salvation to, to the American uh, economic system and the American educational system. I don't think we ever appreciate what the GI Bill meant for women and men uh, in, in, uh, in those periods where they came along afterward and went, went back to school uh, after their military duty. You grew up on Lynch Avenue or thereabouts? Yes. Well, off of 14th Street, as I recall? Yeah, 10th Street. 10th Street? Yeah. What was that neighborhood like back in the... Well, it was a, a sort of mill village. The Atlantic Steel Company, from which now the Atlantic community is developing, uh, the Atlantic uh, Steel Company was the pioneer of the steel industry in Atlanta. <clears throat> My father was employed by them, and I worked. Uh, during the summer uh, when I was in high school uh, at Atlantic Steel Company and played softball and baseball for them uh, at, at that particular time. Uh, the Atlantic Steel Company was uh, the mill village. There was also a mill, mill village, a cotton mill village, which was fairly closely associated with that, but uh, but they were, were, were mill village towns, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that, was the, uh, that was the economic uh, uh, situation of the day. Uh, we didn't have very many private schools in those days. Mm -hmm. There was an occasional private school here or there, but there wasn't anything like the private educational system that we have at the present time. Yeah, GMA at that time was going on, as I recall. GMA was going on at that time. Marist was probably... Marist was there, but uh, relatively minor uh, in numbers. Do you remember the invasion of Poland in 1939? Does that yes. stand out in your mind? What was your reaction to that? Well, I, I was opposed to anything <laughs> uh, that... Uh, uh, was uh, 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 was a, was created by the Germans mm -hmm. at that particular time. So I was opposed to to anything uh, that uh, approximated an invasion of Poland. Nine months after the invasion of Poland, there was something called Dunkirk, as I recall, yes. in May of 1940. Yes. Does, did that make an impression on you at the time? Yes. Uh, Dunkirk uh, was a tremendously impressive factor uh, simply because uh, uh, it, it created uh, the, the reality of world war mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the fact that, that we were almost inevitably being drawn into that, uh, and uh, and each was a different step, uh, but Dunkirk was a very positive step uh, toward the United States being involved in it. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was, of course, one of my favorite heroes because I was just a, a lad in, uh, in those days. Uh, but uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, and uh, uh, and the uh, and the the efforts that were being made uh, to uh, to show us the inevitability of war uh, and the dangers of uh, the uh, European war spread, spreading to the United States were were very apparent to us. The fall of France occurred about five or six weeks after that. Did that make a different impression, or was it just all kind of in your mind melded together now? As a well, I would say, uh, I wouldn't say it was all that much of a uh, particular event at that time. 
but obviously it was just one of the stepping stones yeah. uh, to the uh, the entry into uh, the European War. The uh, United States citizenship, as I recall, was still as a whole against going into full-fledged engagement overseas until Pearl Harbor Day. That seemed to make an impression on everybody's mind December That's right. 7, 1941. Yeah, we, <clears throat> as strongly as we felt about our alliance with uh, uh, Great Britain and even other parts of Europe, including France at that time, <clears throat> because we were still pretty well loyal to France from uh, from uh, World War uh, One, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, we, we still had our loyalties uh, to Europe at that time, and we did not have the strong animosity toward Germany at that time. And of course, Hitler hadn't made his impact uh, so strongly until uh, after a, a long. In, uh, in after Dunkirk and, and sure. in those areas. What was your reaction to Pearl Harbor? Do you remember where you were? Well, when you yeah, were yes. I was in New York <laughs> uh, working uh, on investigations. They were tied into our manpower shortages at that <coughs> time, but I was up there and I was living up there. I, was, I say I was there for, uh, for three months uh, making investigations uh, in, uh, in Buffalo, New York. Uh, I never spoken any Polish before, <laughs> uh, but I learned to speak Polish uh, pretty well, or at least pronounce Polish names <laughs> and, and that a period of time, and uh, uh, but uh, when I was investigating people uh, who were applying for jobs and for applying for automobile insurance and that sort of thing, that was the launching of the first mandatory insurance laws, automobile insurance laws, uh, in, New, in New York State. They already had one in Massachusetts, but that was the first one. And I, I worked in, in the Polish neighborhoods of, uh, of Buffalo uh, uh, for about four months, five months, and uh, and uh, learned to work with them and live with them and and uh, cooperate with them. During any of your investigation time before the war or during the war, did you ever <clears throat> uncover some subvertives who were trying to destroy the country? Did you get, did you get into any espionage investigation or did you just feed your information into a system that <clears throat> never let you know? We, we had a, we had, we sometimes got to, to, to suspect subversives. In other words, we, we would discover subversives or at least suspected subversives. But it was our basis in those days to turn all of that over to the FBI. Okay. And that was, that was our modus operandi <clears throat> at that time. After Pearl Harbor, we had a pretty rough year. Winston Grooms is coming to speak to the History Center tomorrow night on a book entitled 1942, which paints a pretty accurate outlook of what was going on. We lost Pearl Harbor in December. We lost the Pacific, the Philippines, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Singapore. Uh, we did have the Solomon Islands with Guadalcanal and Battle of the Carl Sea and the Battle of Midway uh, that seemed to turn us around. But do you recall what your feelings were during 1942 when all that was going on? Yeah, we were we were almost despaired <laughs> uh, and wondered whether we could ever uh, come back uh, from the uh, onslaught of Pearl Harbor. It was a very, very devastating 
attack against us. Uh, and uh, we either had been untrusting or, uh, or innocent uh, or stupid, <laughs> one, one or the other, that we couldn't have foreseen uh, some of the devastation. Uh, but uh, it was remarkable what uh, the American forces, naval forces did, uh, and, and the way they lived uh, and fought back. And I've lived through all of that history, uh, both historically and, uh, 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 and, and living it, and really thinking about it, because I was sort of preparing myself to fight the rest of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that was sort of the, the, the climate. One, one, seven here. This one side, let's turn this over. Okay, excuse me. You lived it historically and emotionally and personally, and you were preparing yourself to fight the rest of it. That's right. I was mentally uh, and even uh, educationally, geographically, trying to understand. Because, you know, we didn't know where Guam was, even, no. uh, much less uh, some of the of the islands of the Pacific, um, and uh, we still understand very little about uh, that part of the world even. But in any event, uh, uh, we got ourselves geared up for it and understood the magnitude of it. Uh, Truman uh, was a, a very astute leader, in my opinion. Uh, I was in the infantry school at the time Roosevelt died. And I had uh, almost a sinking feeling that we just didn't have the leadership that we needed to take on uh, the Japanese. Uh, or North of the leadership of, of the world, free world. But uh, uh, he had the determination and the will uh, to give it the leadership uh, that it needed. And of course, uh, in my particular instance, uh, uh, I was delivered from having to invade Japan uh, simply because of the dropping of the atom block bomb. And I feel like uh, that uh, that relieved us of how many thousands of casualties that we would have had yeah. uh, as Americans. Now we, of course, have to offset the devastation that we did to the enemy uh, but uh, you, you, you have to equate uh, force against force uh, sure. and battle against battle. Lee, the Korean War was the first kind of control skirmish that the United States found itself in, and <clears throat> we found ourselves in another control skirmish in the Vietnam War. Uh, what are your thoughts about what transpired between, do you think the atom bomb and the fear of the atom bomb having to be utilized by more than one power was the deterrent that made wars become controlled entities as opposed to all out configurations? Uh, do you think there were other factors involved? No. I, I say 
there there are other factors involved because you know we've 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 learned how uh, particularly uh, in recent times uh, to have minor skirmishes and control them <laughs> uh, uh, and not have uh, all-out nuclear wars and 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 I went through a long period of thought and consideration myself uh, when uh, when we used to debate this uh, Senator Nunn uh, was a strong advocate of controlling the nuclear forces uh, and also controlling uh, the exposures to nuclear forces in other nations, Russia, uh, and, uh, and other nations. And I think that the, the mere fact that we've had the threat of nuclear annihil uh, annihil annihilation has been a deterrent. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and and that still prevails. Um, and I, I think it, it still prevails to some degree even when they talk about the use of no, nuclear <coughs> uh, <coughs> nuclear forces in a limited way mm. uh, in, in, uh, in other types of warfare. When we were attacked, on December the 7th, 1941, our shores, even though they were offshores, were invaded. When we were attacked on 9-11, 2001, our inshores were invaded. And the reaction both times were to unify the populace of the United States, one in a world war, and I guess you could call what we're in now a world war also, but it's it's an entirely different type and you still, still have splinter feeling groups about the, how much involved we should be in the Middle East in the war now. Do you have any feelings about what, what transpired in the 60 years between 1941 and 2001 that would cause us to have restraint other than the nuclear threat? I think the nuclear threat was a very substantial factor. Okay. Um, and I think it still is. Uh, and, and I thought about it from the, from the standpoint of not only uh, uh, North Vietnam or, uh, or other areas that, uh, that threaten Saddam Hussein or whoever threatens to uh, provoke a nuclear war, I, I think they, they are deterred by that. Uh, they, they have to take cognizance of it. Uh, and uh, particularly if we show uh, uh, the willingness to, uh, to do what we have to do to to protect ourselves, whatever that might be, and, and I, I'm not trying to sure. uh, allocate uh, uh, the amount of force that would be needed to do that, but I do think uh, that that is a uh, a deterrent. I, I think that's what uh, uh, our former senator from Georgia still preaches and advocates and explains uh, and, uh, uh, and even uses to justify uh, some of, the, ta some of the, uh, the, the actions that we take. And, and I think it's, you know, I, I, I think it's fully in order. Thomas Friedman from the New York Times has written two books in the latest five years, one The Luxus and the Olive Tree and another one called The World is Flat, that point out the differences between educational institutions 
here in America in the industrialized part of the world and less industrialized parts of the world and he also points out the opportunities that the internet is providing us to flatten the playing field of the world so that even those in most impoverished countries will have access to educational systems and a chance to improve their well-being if they can get their act together long enough to to uh, to take advantage of those systems and uh, you've had a great career and been on the Board of Regents of the state educational system, state of Georgia, and I just wonder if you have any thoughts about the technology of the world today in terms of educational opportunities that it's going to provide people from all over the world from different backgrounds. Well, I do. I don't know whether you, you need that kind of explanation from me or not, but uh, um, I'm, I'm a very strong advocate and a very strong believer in Friedman's philosophy. Uh, I, I think that um, we have to we have to be a vital part of the world at large. Uh, I, I, I think we have to be uh, very much engaged in it. And I am myself uh, through uh, work that I do uh, with people in China uh, and, and people in other parts of the world uh, that I have had an opportunity to, uh, to see how they react uh, to other situations. Um, we, we have a, a teaching association at the present time uh, that's engaged in uh, working with people uh, in, in other countries, in other, in other nations. My daughter has just been to, uh, to Greece uh, with the people of the Middle East uh, with uh, 40 ladies from Iraq and Iran and, uh, and, and people of, of that area. Uh, we, we teach them to operate through, uh, through technology uh, and, and many of them are as uh, competent in technology, uh, more competent uh, than many people in the United States, and, and they've, they've learned it, uh, and, uh, and they are growing by leaps and bounds, and, and that's going uh, 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 to make change throughout the world, particularly the Eastern world. Uh, with with increased technology, China is growing today, as it ha as it is, and it, as it apparently is, with technology <clears throat> in, in every matter of, of concern, and and you know it's almost outgrowing us in automobiles nowadays. <laughs> but do you, do you feel like we'll eventually be able to educate the world whether? won't be need for wars because we'll be able to have an international trade system that is so interdependent on one another that we can't afford to war with one another? That would be my ultimate hope. Uh, I, I must admit it is a fondest hope. <laughs> uh, but it would be my ultimate hope that we'd be smart enough to see that we we can't destroy each other, no. uh, and and uh, and this business of killing ourselves, you know, uh, to annihilate ourselves. I mean, that's uh, that's just unbelievably unsound. <laughs> Lee, what do you think the world's population versus the world's energy reserves is going to do in the next twenty or thirty years? Well, we're going to have to revolution our energy reserves. We're going to have to revolutionize our energy energy abilities. We can't depend on gasoline nor the automobile. Uh, we, we, we've got to develop new methods and new means. 
uh, and uh, and the United States has got to get away from uh, the automobile transit system. I um, mean, we we've got we've got to find a way to do that other than uh, than by auto by, by, by gasoline. Uh, and, and by energy. Uh, that's, that's, that's the ultimate challenge to society today, I think. Along those lines, Lee, what lessons would you like to impart to future generations that you've learned in your life that you think are going to be of lasting value? What moral lessons and what economic lessons, what practical tidbits about life would you like for your grandchildren to remember? I would, I would like to revert, if I may, to uh, World War II for a moment. Uh, I, I just think that what we did in World War II, I say we, what the country did in World War II, was a tremendous achievement. It's been a, a tremendous achievement for the world. We wouldn't be where we are today in the world if it were not for World War II and, and what World War II veterans uh, did for it. And, and we ought to recognize the contribution that they have made uh, to society, the societies of the world and the history of the world. You were one of them. Well, <laughs> I was the minor. I think as Paul said, I was the least of them. <laughs> well, what we haven't talked about is that I had the privilege of being lavalier to Lee's daughter, Judy, when I was in the seventh grade. She was one of my first girlfriends, and she's as lovely as her daddy is. Uh, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to you on behalf of my generation generations that fall off of what you were willing to do for us in World War II. Even though you didn't get overseas, you were willing to go. You stayed and kept the home front going and all the contributions you made to the city of Atlanta, the state of Georgia, and to the world in your lifetime. You're truly a remarkable person. And if you think that you can't change whoever's listening to this, this man in front of me, believe it or not, is I think 87? years old and he's talking about getting rid of automobiles. I think he wants to go back to horse and buggy and walking and various modes of transportation that are less energy consumptive than what we have today. Lee, it's been a privilege to have you with us today and to know you all these years. Thank you so very much. Thank you, David.